my identity is something that I always struggled with to say, you know, who am I, right? I know that my, you know, heart is desperately wicked. I know the evil within me. I know that I have the potential to, to cause harm, but seeing myself the way that God sees me is something I have to keep walking through, something I have to keep learning. I was a sophomore in high school when I came to Christ, and then there was a, a local church that was within walking distance of the high school, so I would just kind of spend time there in the office. One of the senior pastors took a notice and said, why don't you just work here? I was like, I don't know, why don't I just work here? And so that kind of started my journey into, into full-time ministry. There was a time where I had uh, borrowed a laptop from one of our staff members, and as soon as I opened it, there was pornography all over it. It slammed it shut, and um, one of the other pastors was there that was a mentor of mine, and so I went to him, and uh, he told me, well, I'll handle it, don't worry about it. The next morning I came into work, and he wasn't there. I just found out that he had been you know, let go and was being transferred to another location. You know, I just kind of learned to keep my mouth shut. Part of the challenge was I had looked up to these people so much and to see that they were failing and see where the things that were being covered up and the things that weren't being talked about. So I was, I'm just looking at the wreckage of these leaders at the wake of, of all of this and saying, why did I want to do this in the first place? Just worked odd jobs, different things. Uh, one of those jobs was Office Max and I met this really cute cashier. It turned out to be Kelsey. And he treated me with so much like respect and love and kindness. When we started going to church together, I, you know, I, I kind of pushed down my feelings and, and all the things that I was dealing with at the time. We kind of just fell away from church in general and kind of lived out our life. We ended up having our second daughter and uh, moved into our house and things were going great. It was, it was supposed to be the happiest times of our life. Well, in my head, I was living the fairy tale. In my mind, I thought, you get married, you're in love, nothing bad's ever gonna happen. But I'm struggling with my faith, I'm struggling with all of that. And um, at the same time, I'm struggling with pornography as a, just an addiction that I had had, even from, from being a small kid. And Kelsey was, had kind of known about that when we got engaged and got married, but had kind of ignored it and kind of swept it under the rug. And it finally came out. I finally couldn't do it anymore. And so I told her, yeah, it was it's something that's still going on. It's something that I'm still struggling with. And him being the only person that I thought wouldn't ever hurt me, I was extremely insecure and thought I was not good enough for anybody. Like, I, I wasn't even good enough for Will. It just tore us apart. And so she started looking for church, which was something that was not something not what she had done before, which was kind of a surprise. And so I walked into River City angry. And everyone else was just happy to be there. Um, you know, here I am bleeding out on the table spiritually and everyone's just so happy. But I was, I was groping in the darkness, not understanding um, what it was gonna take to get my identity back. It, I had gone over two years without having a problem with pornography, but it still wasn't good enough. And so here I am feeling not good enough for my wife, not good enough for God, not good enough for myself. And it kind of came to a head at one point where I, had I was just feeling so dejected and so defeated. Now we, Kelsey and I had a, a minor argument over something that we don't even remember what it is. And um, I walked away from the argument. I went to our bedroom, I went in our closet and I sat down and I shut the door in the dark. I heard a loud boom. Um, and since we've got like weapons and guns in the house, I thought something, he had done something. So I walked back to our bedroom to look again. I still didn't see him, but I saw the closet door was closed. I was very hesitant to open the door. I really didn't know what I was gonna find. I finally opened the door and he was just sitting there crying. And uh, she tries to ask me what's going on and I just didn't have anything to say to her at that point. So I just got up and I walked out the door. And our, our house is near some train tracks. And so Kelsey tried to, to call me and figure out what was going on with my life. Um, when he finally answered, he said, I'm where I want to be. And my mind immediately went to suicide because there's train tracks. Why else would you leave? And what is that supposed to mean? You're where you want to be. I just didn't know where I wanted to be. I just knew I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be in that state where I wasn't good enough. 
At that point, I didn't know what else to do. She floated the idea that we should go to re-engage. The first night of re-engage, first lesson is that you can't love your spouse without God's help. I couldn't do that. I didn't want anything to do with God, much less commit to the idea that I can't even love my wife without God's help. And so we came home and she said, what do you think? And I said, I don't think I can do this. I can't love you the way that Christ loves you and give myself for you. I don't even, I don't even like Christ right now. My hope was gone, all of it. Jesus wasn't gonna be in, in our marriage, this wasn't gonna work, and he didn't want anything to do with God, so well, what am I supposed to do? As we're, um, we're sitting there just in despondency in totally different places, I sat down and I prayed for the first time in about five years. And the real words of that prayer are so profane and so raw and so honest and so broken. Real life sort of words. It was in that moment of just unbridled rage, throwing a tantrum before the God of the universe, that I felt him. I felt God reach down and say, it's gonna be okay. And as I'm feeling this, you know, this embrace from the Heavenly Father I wasn't super happy with, I felt a physical embrace. I just got this like, this this voice telling me to turn around and touch him. And so I did, just a loving way, like I hadn't touched him or anything in a, at least a few weeks. She hugged me for the first time in a real way and started praying over me. Something that she had never done. She had never prayed out loud. And then all this like built up anger and hate it was gone, like it was washed away. And he turned around and I was like, what just happened? Cause we were both crying. He said, well, you're never gonna believe this, but I dared God to show up and you turned around and you touched me. At that point, we gave our marriage, our family to God. We knew that we couldn't do it. We knew that we couldn't fix it. And it's been a work in progress ever since. I always felt like God was in love with some future me, not the me right now. There was some future version of me that God would love but knowing that I'm loved as I am, as broken as I am, and that Jesus would take a cross knowing full well what I would do for God to say, that's okay. I'll, I'll bear that for you. You know, I, I never understood the prodigal son. I never understood why the father would welcome back such a train wreck of a child until I was that train wreck. We want to tell our story because we know that there are people hurting. We know that people are suffering alone and in silence. And we know that brokenness is rampant in our fallen world. And that all it takes is to give that over to God and to be open and to be real with Him. And to be real in your relationships and to be real in community. And so our hope is that through our story that more people would be able to live real life passionately following Jesus in brokenness and in community.